So Jeff, yep, he's online. Yep, Jeff Cookie is here. Jeff, can you hear us? Oh no, he's here. I can't no, he's here. I'm here like it is in my machine. Oh, hello. So next up is hello. from Jeff Cook um, uh, from Swinburne University, and he's gonna tell us about the tech white field imager feeding the next generation. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am, my name is Jeff Cook and I'm from Swinburne in Melbourne, Australia, but I'm actually in France and it's probably not the best internet connection. So I think I'll turn off my video just to ensure that I have good sound because I hope that makes things better. So, so, so um, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit and talk about instrumentation. And this is future instrumentation for Keck. It's the Keck wide field imager that's being developed. It'll be the most powerful wide field optical imager on earth or in space for the foreseeable future and that's decades it's a partnership between australian and um, u.s institutions shown in the logos below um, you know what is kwfi tech wide field imager it's a wide field optical imager it's at the prime focus of keck so this is just an image of interior of keck and it that uh cage up in the upper right there is the, the prime focus and this is a, I can't get this to the forward, sorry. This is a, a computer drawing of the uh, camera in that cage with the, the baffles extended there. And if we um, look at cross section of that, you see that it's a very straightforward yet powerful instrument. Um, there's the, this is a module cutaway. That's the piece that rolls it in and out of that cage. But there are these four lenses, and it's the least number, the fewest number of lenses of any op wide field optical imager. So it has the highest throughput. And this includes an atmospheric dispersion corrector. It's a novel system that uses these lenses and doesn't add any other. So it just really has an extremely high throughput. There are other parts like the camera barrel and hexapod, which gives you six degrees of freedom for flexure and focus and thermal control. There's a rotator here, which the right half here rotates on the sky, the image on the sky. Uh, filter exchanger and filters, which I'll talk about later, shutter, and the detector and cryostat. So this is this is pretty much it. It's very simple and straightforward, again, but it's uh, powerful. This is the focal plane. It's a, it's a degree diameter field of view and overlaid our uh, instruments that kept that image or can image uh, overlaid there. It's showing you that it's much larger. It's made of, up of six or 12, sorry, 6K by 6K CCDs shown here. At least this is the current design. And it has CMOS detectors in the corners here that are for guiding and focus, but also for science. So you can do uh, even down to millisecond exposure times. The readout for this, uh, uh, this uh, these CCDs are only about 10 seconds. So it's gonna be a fast readout. And it's based all, it's all based on the circuit transit facility, successful design, which uh, Antonio just recently mentioned. So, you know, why KWFI? And, and uh, wide field imagers, as, as said here, are fundamental to uh, almost every area, area of astronomy and importantly to all wavelengths like radio, high energy, neutrinos, gravitational waves, et cetera, for locating sources, getting their host galaxies, et cetera. And that's the direction that a lot of uh, facilities or science is going in the future. They're the highest demand instruments on their respective telescopes, which is a testament to their need. And so KWFI will be a facility instrument for this, this work. And it can will also do, because of its capabilities, unique science that no other telescope can do, not even 30 meter telescopes. So let's look, you know, what does the landscape look in say 20, 30, or five years and beyond? Well, there's gonna be these upcoming wide field spectrographs like at Phobos, Mauna Kea, Spectroscopic Explorer, and the Subaru Prime Focus Spectrograph, which will need a, a high density of faint targets to optimize their fields of view. There's these upcoming facilities like the Square Kilometer Array and the Radio, which there are pathfinders that are already in operation. And one of the main sciences of, square, of SKA is uh, mapping the neutral hydrogen at reionization. And KWFI is the only instrument that can actually map the ionized content at reionization using uh, mapping the Lyman continuum uh, flux. And so that's a, a powerful uh, capability. There's Cherenkov Telescope Array, which is a gamma ray facility. Uh, doing high energy gamma rays and sources that aren't necessarily well localized. There are things, um, and then the, uh, the other things in that ballpark, which are neutrino detectors and particle detectors, et cetera. And then there's the 30 meter after telescopes and James Webb Space Telescope, which you know can 
uh, will require very faint, rare, and lens targets, which KWF5 can supply. Then is the current gravitational wave detectors, which are already detecting farther and importantly fainter than what we, the capabilities we have right now. And the new next generation gravitational wave detectors will only make that situation more dire to have a deep wide field imager. And Roman and Euclid are wide field IR tel space telescopes that have uh, are in you know high ranked in astro in the astro 2020, 2020 uh, decade review and and also are doing science that really require photometry, blue photometry, like in the UNG band, which I'll show you in a minute, that, that KWFI is the only telescope that can, the only instrument that can provide. So what do we have right now? We have a white field, these white field images here. There's a mega cam on CTFH, a deck cam, hyper supreme cam in a soon Rubin Observatory. Um, CT, CFHT is going to make way for the Mauna Kea Spectrotropic Explorer, so we're left with these three. None of these have good U-band sensitivity. They're all pretty poor band, poor, and super hyper prime can has none. And also those optics will be shared with the prime focus spectrograph so that uh, accessibility or availability will be smaller. And the Rubin Observatory is gonna do great science, but it's also not for 10 years, it's gonna be doing the legacy uh, LSST survey. So there won't be individual programs for your science in particular, perhaps. And also there's gonna, not gonna be very much time available for TOO programs. So, uh, the Keck Whitefield imager really is going to be important here because it not only does it offer this U-band throughput, but also it's um, very much more sensitive to any of these and will have TOO capability. And for all of those sources I told you before that need that, um, Subaru and Ruben won't really be able to do that. So without KWFI, we'll just have DECCAM. So why Keck? Why are we putting a Whitefield imager on Keck? And that's because Firstly, it's designed for this. It was in the original plans to have a wide field imager and it doesn't require any top end restructuring or observatory restructuring. It just rolls in and out of that cage, just like Cassegrain instruments. You just bring it down to horizon and install it. Uh, Mauna Kea has unparalleled UV transmission, which is not necessarily exploited and we wish to exploit that. And it, those things combined with large, ap our large aperture produces these magnitudes. There's a chart here giving you an example of what depths you can reach in given times. And I want to note that the red here actually will more likely be much more sensitive without sacrificing the blue with chips that we're looking into different than the ones where these were uh, CCDs uh, than the ones that these numbers are made from. But it'll offer things like uh, broadband and narrowband filters, 15 second filter exchange, and, and a deployable secondary that'll enable multiplexing, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Just as another comparison, LSST and their 10 year stack images will reach the depths of what's underlined here in. in teal. And with KWFI, you can reach those depths in a much shorter time, obviously. And it, but, and it's so for targeted science, it's a, it's a very powerful instrument. Finally, the white field of view is really well suited for things like Roman and Euclid fields of view. And that's showing you Elvis footprint there. And this is the KWFI field of view, which matches well, and also uh, these white field spectrographs. And the this is going back to what I said earlier, the, the Roman and Euclid have this range, uh, wavelength range shown off to the right there on the bottom and UV satellites that may come online in the future are off to the left. And KBFI is gonna cover this wavelength range here that's, that's missing and, and crucially from 3000 to about 5000 angstroms where deep photometry is gonna be needed for things like a BAO and weak lensing, um, photo, photo, photo Z's and dropout galaxies. Tons of science that you can do. I can't even cover any of this. So I, I rec you know, highly recommend you see this archive art, uh, article that listed there that explain all these. But I can just highlight, as I mentioned, Lyman continuum galaxy work can only be done uh, with KWFI. Um, there, in every, all of these cases, there's science that can only be done with KWFI. And, and I, I, this is not time to get into it, but I'll be happy to talk about it afterwards. <laughs> But it's all areas from the solar system to the high redshift universe. So I'll just end with uh, what's been done to date, and that's uh, in the U.S. There's think work on the detectors done at Caltech. UCO is working on the actual fabricate or the design and, and optical mechanical parts of it, including the the barrel, et cetera. In Australia, the optical design is was developed, and the filter exchange mechanism um, is being built, and also all of the instrument control and data reduction pipelines, et cetera. This is just a quick movie showing you the, that actually this filter exchange mechanism is in built or is being built in an operation. And this is how fast, like if you have a filter in right now and you're observing and you wanna change filters, you know, start your clock, this is how long it will take to change your filters. 
which is about 10 seconds, and it's much better than um, any other system out there. And these filters are 600 millimeters, so they're, they're, they're big, right? They're very big. So it's going to be a, a really powerful system to do all kinds of good science. Um, to end this year, we're going to be doing testing on that filter mechanism to then develop the rest of, the rest of it, because they're going to have four more of those layers to give you eight filters. There's going to be work on smart sensors and this, this industry 4.0 technology being applied to it to make it a smart instrument. And there's development on the secondary mirror system, which I'll end with here. And that's this, uh, this is a side view of the instrument. And in the front, there is a, is a secondary mirror that would reflect light back to the, down to instruments below, but it can, it'll be deployed out of, in and out of the line of sight like this. So you can, you can be using KWS right now and then put it in place. And within minutes, you could be getting spectra with an instrument that's hot on, on CAC, which is a very powerful capability. But to do that, we're looking into all the all the things that are needed for that, and that includes uh, the laser mount. The laser launch is on mounted currently on the module here, which is in the left image. We'll have mounted onto the cage, which is a more stable situation, but also makes room for KWFI to be be there permanently. And also, there's other other aspects with the module I mentioned before. We'll make that uh, differently to make room for this this secondary mirror, which would allow us like an inst a quick installation. So all of these, these aspects are being worked on and considered uh, this year and into next year. So the, uh, I'll end with just saying some bullet points here about how it's, it's gonna be, again, the most powerful uh, white field optical imager. And it's, there's really nothing uh, in the plan that can do this kind of work. So it'll be the only one doing it. And we've been, already gone through a lot of design and funding and, de uh, and development, and we've applied for major funding at right now, so we'll find out sometime soon from Australia government funding. And if other uh, US funding, which we plan for, uh, comes through, then if this, this plan timeline here, this simple timeline will happen where the construction will be starting towards the end of next year on through 2027 and, and the hopes of a 2027 uh, first light. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Uh, would an adaptive secondary mirror be would be uh, challenging or uh, difficult from you know uh, what you guys have learned for now? Did you hear the question? Um, not quite. Something about adaptive secondary mirror, I think. So would that be difficult if you're asking? So you didn't really understand. Uh, will it work? <laughs> would it work? <laughs> from from everything from everything I've heard, you're saying would could this that adaptive secondary be the deployable secondary mirror? I think is the question. And and yeah, everything we've looked. I mean, we we prefer that. We'd like that. And everything we've looked at, it looks like it it could work. But it's just uh, that has to develop farther, and we have to also look more into space and mass budgets but but it is a light a light mirror so that's a advantageous so yes that the idea is hopefully to have that as the as the deployable secondary you mentioned about um part of the instrument rotating and i was having trouble following that does that mean some lenses are on the rotating part and some are on the stationary part um the Yes, the uh, the lens that is the doubles as a doer window rotates, but the rest do not. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a question for for you. Um, thinking about the discovery potential of having you know multiple square degree images across the sky at very depth deep uh, level, what do you go up? Okay. Sorry. So with multiple deep images uh, at multiple filters across the sky, there's a lot of discovery potential here for just random stuff. So what's the data reduction pipeline? Could that go to catalog generation so that people could start mining that data? So that's maybe a question for both of you. No, that, thanks for coming up too, I appreciate it. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the plan is to have uh, a data reduction pipeline similar to, similar to a program that I run where we do it in real time. So it's just within minutes. And so you can process these data. Um, minutes later, you'll have sources, catalogs, or, you know, like um, 
the source is extracted with with uh, information, and then of course you can do your your own preferential selection of objects. Because one of the aims is to have imaging done, and then again within just a few minutes, as you move the mirror back in, you can set up for spectroscopy. Just that same well, right minutes later, so same same night. I have a question. Um, so for the CMOS detectors, um, is there any way you can have a have them in frame transfer mode? So you can have like no read up time for fast photometry. I think I got that. Yeah, I mean they 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 can they're going to be CMOS, so you're going to be yeah have essentially no readout, and it can be as as fast as almost millisecond if that's what you're asking. Yes, yeah, so you can do very very fast. Yeah. Oh, that, we don't have more time for questions. So thank you very much. Um,